This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Today's guest is Stella Assange, an attorney specializing in international law, a human rights activist, and the wife of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, with whom she has two children. Stella, thank you for talking with us today. Thanks for having me. Julian Assange was arrested outside England's Ecuadorian embassy after his political asylum was revoked and moved to Belmarsh Prison in April 2019. And that's a maximum security facility where inmates are held in small single cells. Amnesty International has drawn parallels to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, reports and statements from doctors emerged quickly after that imprisonment, testifying to his deteriorating mental and physical health. How is he doing today? Um, well, as we film this, um, we're nearing his fifth uh, year, his fifth uh, Christmas in Belmarsh Prison. And he has been there uh, for over four and a half years now. Uh, because the U.S. is trying to extradite him since the 11th of April 2019. And he hasn't left the facility um, to go to court since January 2021. That was the last time they allowed him to come to court to his own hearings. Uh, since then, uh, he's been uh, participating remotely over video link because they don't let him to even go to the courtroom. Uh, he's uh, physical state has obviously deteriorated, deteriorated over that time. He spends um, a lot of time in his cell, uh, but he is able to receive visits. So once or twice a week, I can go and see him. On weekends, I can bring the kids, um, and that obviously helps him a lot. He can call me from Belmarsh Prison uh, during certain hours throughout the day. Uh, so we uh, are in contact um, ongoingly during the day for most days, unless there's some kind of problem. And that obviously keeps him uh, sane and um, helps us both, uh, you know, um, feel like we're not so separated and apart. Um, what, what can you, I mean, I imagine this is, you know, you're, you're a mother, you, you have kids together. Um, you know, how, how often are you actually able to travel and see him and kind of what is the personal situation like for you? Well, it's obviously very difficult. Um, our children are, uh, the oldest one is six and a half and the youngest one will turn five in February. And uh, they, all their memories of Julian are inside this one big visiting hall inside Belmarsh prison. And I, you know, I, I uh, reiterate that Julian is only there um, because there is this extradition request from the US. He's not charged of any crime in the UK. Um, they're just holding him on behalf of the United States that is opposing bail. And so we have to, um, we're forced to uh, interact within this extremely harsh environment. And that's how the children, that's all the children know, um, visiting uh, their father inside a, a big, loud, monitored uh, visiting hall once a week, more or less. How um, do you explain to the children, like, was there ever a time when you sort of explained what was going on and contextualized the children why their father is in this type of environment? Like, how much do they know? Or is this just the only thing they've ever known? Um. Well, it's it's really a mix of the two. So I've tried to introduce context as they grow older. I didn't want them to understand what a prison was before um, before other concepts like you know <laughs> freedom and fairness. Um, but uh, so it, actually, it was our eldest son Gabriel. At one point, I guess he was around five, or yeah, it must have been around five, where he asked whether um, whether Julian was in prison, this place that we went to, was it a prison? And I told him yes. Uh, before that, I would say we're going to the big building where daddy is and it's not daddy's home, he's just being kept there. And obviously they experienced the whole um, process of going through the prison security, which is 
everyone has to go through it. You know, everyone, including toddlers, uh, have to be searched by the dogs. They look inside their mouths and so on. Uh, they get patted down. Um, so they're, they've seen that and they live it. And um, eventually, um, they, um, the eldest one asked me if this was a prison. And I explained that, yes, it's a prison, but that daddy hasn't done anything wrong. In fact, um, he's done good things and he's being punished by bad people. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm trying to explain it in age appropriate ways uh, and also trying to also uh, counter the, um, you know, the, the immediate horror of the situation with the fact that lots of people support Julian and are fighting for his freedom. And uh, sometimes I've taken them to protests and so on so that they actually see that there are a lot of people that support Julian and that actually there's something bigger going on and it's not just... Um, he's just not, he's not just any other prisoner. And that's obvious from when you visit Belmarsh, there's, you know, um, huge banners saying free Julian Assange. There are protests, which we see, um, often there's, uh, at least once a week, there's a protest, people going into the prison, into the prison premises, uh, with loudspeakers and calling for him to be released and all the visitors, all the family members and friends who go and visit their uh, the prisoners that are inside see it as well. So um, obviously this isn't something that the other prisoners have. This is a, a, a unique case and they, they, they can sense that there's something special about their dad. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've explained it in different ways. Um, I've told them, you know, it's not that the guards themselves who they see and interact with are holding their father uh, specifically. It's the, you know, it's, it's the people above them, the people who decide, and they're the people that Julian uh, made angry because he showed them, um, he, he showed the world that they had done bad things and they're angry about that. Um, and uh, that's that's generally how I, I try to explain it. Um, and they understand, um, I tell them, daddy's a hero, millions of people around the world admire him, he spoke the truth, and sometimes it's difficult to tell the truth, uh, and a lot of people will get angry and try to take revenge, but but um, it's it's important, and um, and that's what that's what Julian did. Well, so you, you first met Julian, if I'm not mistaken, um, when he was fighting sexual assault charges uh, in Sweden, and you, you initially joined his, his defense team. What made you interested in that case, and what's your perspective on that whole case? Well, I joined his legal team in February 2011, and uh, the so Julian had started publishing the WikiLeaks uh, publications uh, from that had been uh, sent to WikiLeaks by Chelsea Manning in 2010, so a, a year before I joined his team. And so these publications from Chelsea Manning, which were uh, the Collateral Murder video, um, the Iraq War Logs, Afghanistan War Diaries, um, Diplomatic Cables and Guantanamo Bay Files, and these are the same publications that Julian is indicted with, um, indicted over now. Uh, that had happened uh, in the lead up to um, me joining his legal team. And it had also started uh, prior to any preliminary investigation being opened in Sweden. And uh, actually there were never any charges in Sweden, uh, none were brought. And that's quite amazing because um, it kind of defies logic, right? Because there was a big extradition case and um, Sweden would say, well, we haven't decided whether to actually bring charges against him, but we just want to question him. And then um, there was this question about, well, why don't you just question him? Because in, you know, in hundreds of other cases, uh, the Sweden would travel to other European countries to question him and so on. Anyway, that Swedish preliminary investigation um, was uh, dropped and resurrected multiple times. It was dropped four times resurrected three, um, no charges were ever brought. Uh, the, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, the, the, um, the amazing thing about this case is that the prosecutor was refusing to question him. And you think, how can it possibly be that in a, in a sex case where of course memories fade and, and it all depends on, you know, um, 
the recollections of of the people involved and so on, that the prosecutor um, had to be compelled by the Swedish Court of Appeal uh, six years after the fact um, to question him. And uh, the reason the Court of Appeal compelled her was she said uh, that she had failed her her um, professional duty to um, advance the case. And of course, this is just one um, aspect of how that Swedish preliminary investigation was abusive. And the reason it was abusive was because it was um, it took place in a highly charged uh, political moment in which Julian was being um, actively um, sought by uh, authorities because he was about to publish um, the Chelsea Manning leaks. He had already published the collateral murder video and the Afghan war logs. And then it was one month um, before uh, WikiLeaks started publishing the Iraq war logs um, that he went to Sweden. There's actually a Daily Beast article uh, it's archived. It's it's no longer on the website, but it's archived, in which uh, the U.S. Uh, the reporter says that the State Department was contacting its allies in Europe um, and urging them to find a way to stop Julian and his tracks to arrest him on whatever, um, because they had by then they had arrested uh, Chelsea uh, Manning, then Bradley Manning, um, and they knew that WikiLeaks had more major. Uh, leaks coming out. And so they wanted to stop him in his tracks. They contacted the Australians. The Australians were looking to cancel his passport. And then there was an investigation by the Australian police. And then the Australian police recommended not cancelling his passport because it would be easier to track his movements. And ultimately, um, uh, Sweden in initiated this preliminary investigation, which was um, condemned by the United Nations as an abuse against Julian's um, rights uh, as a defendant. He was in fact never a, formally a defendant because he was never charged, which meant that he was never given access to exculpatory evidence of text messages that we knew existed. Um, and so the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture also did an investigation in 2019, wrote to the Swedish and UK governments um, who ref refused to um, cooperate. He wrote a whole book about it. It's called The Trials of Julian Assange. And for um, any viewers who are interested in this kind of Swedish um, uh, preliminary investigation, which also served to, um, you know, cast a shadow on Julian, um, to treat him as uh, an accused person without being formally accused and so on. Uh, there are two key books. One is by this special rapporteur on torture, uh, Niels Meltzer, and it's called The Trials of Julian Assange. And then there's another one called um, WikiLeaks and Its Enemies uh, by Stefania Marizzi, which is a Italian um, investigative journalist. And she's done, actually these two books are very complimentary because um, the one by the special rapporteur um, involves his own investigation into um, the reports, his uh, communications with the governments in, in a formal manner, you know, as a, a UN official. And uh, Stefania Marizzi, as an investigative journalist, she has done a lot of FOIA work and obtained um, a bunch of uh, correspondence, some of which had been destroyed by one party, which is the, the UK government, um, which is incredibly damning. And it shows how in fact, there was a collusion between the UK and Sweden, um, that this, uh, the, the UK was telling Sweden not to question him, to extradite him, to put him in, and, and the U Sweden was going to put him in custody immediately um, and um, urging them not to progress the investigation unless he was extradited. Uh, and of course, this is this is um, extremely bizarre and, and um, uh, unjust, of course, um, denying a suspect the ability to defend himself. But of course, if you if you think this is um, just a regular case, then uh, none of it makes sense. But you under, once you understand um, the political context, then of course, it all makes sense. And it even says in this correspondence that Stefania Marizzi discovered uh, literally the sentence, please do not think that we are treating this as just any other extradition case. That's the words of the uh, UK um, prosecution 
authority who was uh, communicating with the Swedish authorities. And then when Sweden tried to drop it in 2013, um, the UK responded, Please, uh, don't you dare get cold feet, um, mm. uh, telling them not to drop it. So uh, it's pretty clear. I mean, it's very clear now to, to you know, extremely uh, detailed, uh, exhaustive ex examinations about um, the Swedish uh, preliminary investigation and as I said, for which Julian was never charged. Uh, but of course, as soon as that was dropped, um, it was revealed that there was uh, a an indictment that had come under the Trump administration and Julian has been um, in Belmarsh uh, in relation to that extradition request from the US since 2019. So I want yeah. to get into the extradition request in a moment, but I am curious. So you're basically saying Sweden was engaged in a politically motivated witch hunt of Julian. But the thing that I'm also curious about is, you know, these are uh, not the traditional circumstances under which most people meet their spouses. Um, what was this like for you emotionally? Was this this sense of, I mean, most of the time when you meet somebody who becomes your husband, they're not, you know, being accused of rape uh, in another country. Um, how did you feel signing up to work on this case and then getting to know Julian? Like what was swirling around in your head? Well, I was um, steeped in the in the um, documents surrounding this uh, Swedish preliminary investigation, and um, there was no case to answer from the beginning. It was pretty clear that the uh, administrative use of the extradition uh, request from Sweden uh, was a way to uh, trap him, basically to bury him in a legal um, quagmire. Uh, in order to interfere with his publishing work. I mean, in, in Sweden, as I said, like the, the initial prosecutor who uh, looked at the case said there, there is no um, crime of rape involved in these allegations. Um, but the Swedish, um, look, the Swedish uh, conduct in this case also responds to uh, local dynamics. Uh, the, the person who took on the case within days um, was also running for, for um, uh, there were general elections in Sweden. He was tipped to become the new uh, justice minister. Um, Julian's case was in the media. Uh, there were a lot of motivations. It wasn't just the, uh, you know, possible nudge or likely nudge from the State Department at the highest levels. Uh, Julian, um, Julian's name was was leaked to the press, uh, which should never happen in the case of a preliminary investigation where the person hasn't even been formally accused. And as I said, he was never formally accused in those nine years. Um, the UN's uh, Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, which looked at this case from 2014 onwards, um, saw uh, the um, underlying investigation material. It was an adversarial process in which Sweden and the UK um, also participated and were unsuccessful in convincing this um, group of UN experts on arbitrary detention um, that they had conducted themselves in a lawful manner. They had, in fact, violated international obligations concerning arbitrary detention when it came to Julian, because, as I said, he was neither convicted or even charged in relation to Sweden. Um, and so it was this extraordinary abusive nature of the Swedish allegations um, that was immediately obvious to me as uh, a member of his legal, legal team, but also as a Swedish speaker, because I'm fluent in Swedish and so I could directly access the, um, um, the material of the case uh, that we had access to, to see that this was uh, absurd. And, and my own experience, I mean, as I got to know Julian, was to see how he was uh, persecuted and um, maligned in all sorts of ways. Of course, the Swedish aspect was just one. It was an effective one because uh, Julian had a lot of support from the left uh, initially um, because these publications concerned, of course, the Bush Wars and so on. And a sex case, um, even one without a formal accusation or a conviction or anything, uh, obviously is going to alienate um, a portion of the left um, and and uh, a big portion of women, um, and 
there was a deliberate uh, strategy, as as these uh, FOIA documents show, to keep him in this uh, position of not being able to defend himself, of not being able to, um, you know, clear his name because they refused to question him. Um, Sweden refused to give him a guarantee that he wouldn't be onwardly extradited to the U.S. And Sweden, in fact, you know, in spite of its um, its reputation. Uh, was a participant in the CIA rendition um, uh, program. It rendered um, Agiza and um, Alzeri two asylum seekers who were in the process of ap applying for protection. And instead they were taken on a CIA flight and tortured in Egypt. And um, this was one of the most obvious, um, one of the most shocking cases of CIA rendition concerned Sweden. And in fact, since 2001, uh, Sweden, I don't know if it's still true, but definitely while Julian was still um, facing um, potential extradition to Sweden, Sweden has not once rejected an extradition request to the United States. And this is different to the UK, which has, it's it's rare, but has rejected extradition requests to the United States. So this was also a factor in, in uh, Julian's decision to resist extradition to, to Sweden, which is a very small country and views yeah. itself as a very small country, uh, certainly in relation to the US. Britain I mean, has you, a similar similar mentality, but Sweden, you can't even compare. Yeah, uh, you, you've you laid out lots of reasons to be skeptical of the Sweden sex case against Assange. And I mean, I would think that any objective observer looking at what has happened to him the way he was extradited, kind of immediately, or sorry, not extradited, uh, imprisoned immediately after the asylum was lifted, should at least make you raise an eyebrow as to what was going on there. But um, I, I want to raise a couple of criticisms uh, that that you hear commonly. Um, you know, one comes from the intelligence community in the United States, government officials, which we can get to that later, but. First, while we're on this topic, one thing that you hear a lot from people who are more friendly to WikiLeaks, you know, WikiLeaks, as you mentioned, was kind of embraced on the American left and then kind of fell out of favor. Um, there's people who were or are friendly to its mission who say that Julian Assange is he's a problematic figure. He's kind of an egomaniac who puts his personal legal troubles and grudges above the mission of the organization. It's a theme that you see in multiple documentaries produced about him, including Risk by Laura Poitras, who's sympathetic, but sort of takes this position that, you know, Julian's personal troubles are, are intertwined too much with WikiLeaks mission. What do you make of that kind of criticism? Well, it's it's really a dated criticism because that kind of criticism came about when the extradition case in relation to Sweden was a, a lie. Um, yeah. When a lot of facts concerning the Swedish um, extradition, the fact that he wasn't even charged, uh, the fact that, you know, all this FOIA documentation that we now know and which is now in the public domain um, had come out and so on. And so a lot of people at the time were saying, well, he has nothing to worry about. The US doesn't want to extradite him. This mm -hmm. is all about Sweden, et cetera. And uh, unfortunately, um, risk is um, fell into that trap. Uh, it's very dated now when you watch it because uh, obviously what happened was that uh, Julian was indicted in relation to um, the Afghan and Iraq war publications and so on. And uh, look, a lot of these um, uh, portrayals came about in the immediate aftermath of these publications. So what happened um, in 2010, 2011, uh, was that WikiLeaks came onto the scene um, and broke more significant stories um, by than the legacy press had, um, you know, in in 50 years combined. Um, and of course, WikiLeaks had partnered with uh, the New York Times, the Guardian and uh, three major European papers as well in Germany, Spain, um, and France 
and to to kind of maximize the uh, the coverage of these big databases. Um, and so they would publish the the cables, the war logs, and so on in coordination, um, doing joint investigations and so on uh, with these big papers. Once the big papers had published together with WikiLeaks, then there wasn't much utility in that partnership and they distanced distance they themselves. And Julian was also a critic of the way that these major papers um, reported on the WikiLeaks publications, the way they redacted information that exposed them uh, perhaps to um, lawsuits from oligarchs, uh, whereas uh, the content was um, of such significance that, that um, and also, you know, WikiLeaks had already published on their website. So there was, from that perspective, um, no um, uh, serious uh, legal threat. Um, but so Julian has been, you know, a media critic. He has been criti uh, criti cr critical of um, the major media players. And yeah. of course, he was an outsider. He's Australian. Um, this is a an internet publisher, um, an internet publisher that attracted very high quality sources who entrusted WikiLeaks as the vehicle with which um, this information could reach uh, the public. And the reason for that was that WikiLeaks had uh, and has a pretty much um, well a, a a very um, high grade um, submission system, which has since been um, uh, kind of copied by, by the mainstream. There's a very interesting paper by um, Jack Goldsmith, who was the, who is a former assistant um, attorney general under a Republican administration, I can't remember which, called the Wikileaksization of the American Press. And what he argues is uh, that actually the American press adopted the innovations that WikiLeaks had um, pioneered by the mid um, uh, 2010s, right? Um, the New York Times, Washington Post, The Guardian, etc. they all have the same or similar technology. They adopted the technology that WikiLeaks invented um, for the um, submission of using uh, encryption to be able to protect sources when they communicate and also uh, the submission systems so that you don't necessarily, as uh, the receiver of information, know who the source was and uh, provide the source with sufficient um, um, encryption so uh, knowledge to be able to mask um, their identity. And so this became uh, a, adopted by the mainstream press. Another innovation that WikiLeaks brought was to, to create partnerships um, between media organizations. It was WikiLeaks who basically forced the New York Times to cooperate with The Guardian, to cooperate with Le Monde and El Pais and so on. It had never been done before. It wasn't easy. And um, part of the reason why um, the there was, um, uh, you know, a, a dis a distancing uh, from Julian, uh, I think, was because uh, they they didn't like to work um, in a way that was not on their own terms, even when it was with other major um, major uh, media partners. And so, when Julian um, came onto the scene, he was seen as a as a um, competitor, but also as a threat to the mainstream media's. Um, economic model. You know, this is like 2010. So mm -hmm. the the media was only just kind of um, the major papers were, were publishing online. Um, their their uh, advertising revenue was down. People weren't buying papers anymore. And they were like, how are they going to survive? Lots of people were being fired and so on. And here comes WikiLeaks uh, that has a completely different business model, which is uh, it's small, uh, has a lot of volunteers um and uh and it's reader funded and of course now we see reader funded um publications quite a lot but at the time um 
you know, apart from some bloggers perhaps, but this was a, a re reader funded publication that was unfettered by advertising, um, you know, restrictions and so on. And that at the same time was having such high quality sources uh, come to, to them and having high impact and enabling it to enter into partnerships with the biggest media organizations, the media, biggest media houses, and basically being able to call the shots because WikiLeaks was the one that attracted the sources. And of course, um, once the, um, the legal trouble started and the financial blockade, um, Bank of America, PayPal, Western Union, and so on, blocked uh, the donations to WikiLeaks as soon as WikiLeaks had started to publish the State Department cables. This was also the time when Julian was arrested over the Swedish um, allegations. This all happened within a week. Um, so it all came down at the same time. And then these major media organizations who had partnered with WikiLeaks um, then turned against Julian. And basically, I think I think the objective was to try to kill off WikiLeaks because mm. because it was a competitor because um, uh, it has had such an important impact and was a newcomer and uh, a, a threat to the kind of gate gatekeeper function that we all know. Um, so we do have a has. we have a, a montage of some MSNBC hosts reacting to Assange. I was wondering if you would roll that, Zach, um, and then we'd love to get your reaction. I have a follow up question after that. Many establishment journalists in the U.S. consider Julian Assange to be a criminal whose work doesn't fit in the same category as their own. No journalism here. What we have is an act of espionage. The wholesale dumping of WikiLeaks actually isn't journalism. If you help in the stealing of classified material, nothing about the First Amendment is going to insulate you from charges that you stole, regardless of whether or not you publish it. I mean, you learn that day one in news business school. I find this whole montage very funny because we've actually seen this sort of reiterated, um, you know, basically from this time all the way up until now. I mean, it's still a thing that people talk about, maybe not with the specific espionage framing, but there's this line drawn between, well, these people are journalists over here, but these other people surely don't qualify. And so therefore their First Amendment protections ought to be different. How How do you feel when you see you know, MSNBC hosts treating Julian Assange this way, Stella? Well, I mean, it's it's kind of, um, it's a bit disappointing because the criticisms that they um, use are just simply not true. Um, uh, you had uh, Maria Ressa there. She, she was a CNN um, presenter and then um, uh, she's a uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner and has herself um, faced uh, political prosecution because of her journalism. And it's really disappointing uh, that she says something like uh, WikiLeaks dumping. This is one of the um, major uh, mis, uh, say, distortions concerning WikiLeaks. Uh, WikiLeaks does privilege uh, the publication of archives, but it doesn't just dump. It's, uh, you know, it, it provides context it writes up context uh, it writes up analyses um it, it um has redacted uh information and states the the criteria for redactions and so on um but even so i mean all of this is really irrelevant whether julian's a journalist or not the question is is julian accused of journalism and he is it is the activity that has been criminalized um not um whether he uh, falls into a category or not. Uh, it's the category of the activity that is being criminalized. Uh, receiving, obtaining, and uh, communicating information to the public. And, you know, the use of the Espionage Act, it's, it's uh, very interesting because you see kind of lazy journalists, uh, lazy reporters, lazy, um, sometimes I think it's, it's also deliberate, right? Uh, talking about Julian as if he is being um, accused of being a spy. Now, this is, of course, you enter into the realm of absurdity uh, when when you start talking about uh, the, the allegations against Julian, because the first point is that Julian is Australian. Um, he's not American. He's never lived there. 
Um, and the use of the Espionage Act allows for this kind of um, laziness, categorical laziness. Um, and that's because the Espionage Act uh, is a very broadly worded, indeterminate piece of text that was adopted in 1917 um, and that has been interpreted in an increasingly expansive way. And uh, especially under the Obama administration, you have uh, for the first, well, actually, um, it had been used against journalistic sources, but in, in, in quite a selective manner before uh, the Obama administration. The Obama administration really ramped up the use of the Espionage Act against journalistic sources. Um, and there's no allegation that those that there was some kind of foreign power involved, uh, rather that these were um, uh, newspapers, TVs, whatever, that were receiving information from from the person accused under the Espionage Act and um, under the Obama administration, um, three times uh, the uh, three times more people were prosecuted as sources of um, of uh, uh, news stories than all previous administrations in the hundred years that preceding it preceded it combined, and so um, this expansive trend that started with the Obama administration then uh, continued and became even more extreme under the Trump administration. So it actually uh, took the US eight years to bring an indictment against Julian. And it came under the, um, the Trump administration. Actually, just before this, um, I don't mean to read much here. I just found this quote that was really interesting. So. Um, there was a case called the Morrison case in 1984, and this was a source who was um, indicted and convicted under the uh, Espionage Act for disclosing classified photos to a British military journal. And um, there was a uh, judge, Harvey Wilkinson, who in his concurring opinion um, said that this would be limited to uh, the role of the source because press organizations are not being and probably could not be prosecuted under the Espionage Act because the political firestorm that would follow uh, prosecution of one who exposed an administration's own ineptitude would make such prosecutions an unrealistic prospect. So in other ways, in other words, he was saying that what limits the Espionage Act is political safeguards. It is hmm. the, the outcry, it is the reaction to um, the preposterous use of the Espionage Act against the press. And so what has happened is that the Espionage Act has been used in that way. It's been used against Julian, it's precedent setting, and uh, the supposed outcry that was supposed to limit this kind of use of the Espionage Act has not followed. Yeah, uh, although I, I do think there have been an increasing number of journalists, especially people in national security reporting who have been awakened to the they they realize the implications of what happens if there is a uh, successful prosecution against Julian Assange. I think with some of these MSNBC hosts, uh, a lot of this is uh, tied up with what happened in the 2016 election. Uh, WikiLeaks involvement with the DNC emails. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, Hillary Clinton has, has positioned or has said, uh, uh, has positioned herself kind of the chief rival of uh, Julian Assange. And, and Assange had not too kind words for uh, her uh, either. Um, you know, uh, Mike Pompeo, who uh, was uh, serving as a CIA chief under uh, Trump was the one who labeled WikiLeaks a um, kind of hostile intelligent, non-state hostile intelligence service. This all, all that unfolded in 2016 between WikiLeaks uh, and uh, the U.S. government during the election. Um, how do you think that changed the tenor of the conversation and the way that people view WikiLeaks? Um, and what do you say to people who do get a suspicious feeling, who think that there's some weird relationship between Julian Assange and Russia? I mean, you know, they're, like he had a show on Russia Today for a while. 
There have been some Russians who've worked for WikiLeaks. Um, should people be so. suspicious? I don't think there are any Russians who have worked for WikiLeaks. Um, WikiLeaks, uh, well, Julian had a talk show um, that was licensed to a number of channels. And uh, R Russia Today at the time, this was 2011. I mean, you, this is a long time ago. This is yeah. like 13 years ago. Um, had the license for Julian's talk show, which is also available on YouTube because it was also licensed to others. Um, and um, that was the extent of his involvement with any, um, you know, he licensed a show. It was a UK production company that he owned. Um, so, um, but these allegations have never been substantiated because there is no nothing to substantiate. Uh, the uh, Mueller report, of course, uh, came up with nothing. Um, the national security directors in January 2017, already uh, during a um, congressional hearing, uh, said that in relation to the 2016 election material, they had no um, no evidence of any anything um, untoward mm -hmm. uh, concerning WikiLeaks. Um, you know, it's it's all been uh, speculation. It's all basically coming down to Julian licensed a show to RT in 2011. Um, it, it's it's uh, weak to say the least. Of course, in relation to the 2016 publications, there was a strategy by the Hillary campaign to um, talk about uh, Russia as allegedly um, interfering with that elect uh, election and so on. But taken uh, when you look at the WikiLeaks publications specifically, um, that had you know nothing to do with this other stuff, the DC leaks and I don't know what, um, mm -hmm. which others did publish, uh, like. Um, the Hill and others published stuff that they said they got from this character, Guccifer too. Right. Um, that's separate to um, what, what WikiLeaks published, which was uh, the DNC leaks and the Podesta emails. And earlier in the year, they had, they had also republished um, the um, Hillary Clinton emails that had been put up on the State Department website, but which were not easily accessible. So there were actually three Clinton publications. Um, so the DNC ones uh, revealed how the Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton campaign had rigged uh, the Democratic primaries and basically defrauded um, the Democratic um, um, donors who were being misled that, uh, at least the Bernie ones, who were being misled that their candidate that they were supporting actually had a chance of becoming a nominee. Um, so uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign, of course, afterwards, one found out that uh, in Donna Brazil's book, uh, that uh, there was a secret agreement between the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign. Um, and there was, it was even a written agreement and uh, that they were colluding basically to undermine and uh, uh, ensure that Bernie Sanders did not get the equal, um, uh, did not get access to the media and, and so on. Um, and then the Podesta emails, which came in October, were uh, showed how the Hillary Clinton campaign had also um, basically rigged the, um, the Republican um, uh, primaries in the sense that they had this thing called the Pied Piper strategy in which they would get their mates in the uh, MSNBC and so on to get Trump on the airwaves because according to the Hillary campaign uh, their view was that um, Trump and a couple of other Republican candidates which they viewed as extreme and um, unelectable uh, would alienate the swing voters and so on, and that as if they if they gave Trump airtime and if they convinced their allies in the press to give Trump airtime, then Hillary would win. And of course, we knew uh, what happened after that. So these were, you know, 
incredibly important and uh, publications. And in fact, there was a court case that um, many people haven't even heard about. The DNC tried to um, actually um, tried to sue uh, WikiLeaks and Julian personally in New York, in the Southern District of New York, uh, in relation to the D DNC publications. And that uh, case was thrown out by the judge on First Amendment grounds. And in fact, he said that this was uh, the type of publication that uh, enjoys the highest protection of the First Amendment, because you cannot think of a more important um, uh, publication than that concerning uh, political candidates in the lead up to an election. That is of the highest you know, significance for the public to know about. Um, and then, so uh, I, that's a really important and strong judgment. The New York Times afterwards gave a, a um, interview to the to the BBC saying, well, if they had received it, they would have also published it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, talking about who the possible source is, is irrelevant if the material is of um, the significance that that uh, these these publications actually had. But of course, I think it, it raises important questions about whether it's really possible in the US media landscape to be truly independent. Can you alienate Democrats and Republicans and still, um, and still enjoy uh, protection, you know, under, even under the law, like the political heat on you and on WikiLeaks having published damning information, both about Republicans and post-2016 about Democrats, has, has placed Julian in an extremely vulnerable position, uh, vulnerable in, in the sense that if the protections, if the First Amendment protections are not robust enough, if the political climate is such um, where there is a, a push for censorship, a push um, for propaganda, for, uh, um, you know, uh, repression uh, when it comes to speech, uh, then, then uh, these this political restraint that that um, I was talking about earlier on the Espionage Act becomes ineffective. I want to take us back in time to 2010 for a second, um, which was when WikiLeaks made its first big release with the collateral murder video, which showed, you know, a 2007, I guess, U.S. airstrike in Baghdad killing, you know, a dozen, over a dozen civilians uh, and really exposed some of the horrors of that war to an American audience for the first time. What was the impact of that video and what has the broader impact of WikiLeaks releases been on the world? And actually, before you answer that, Stella, we have a clip from a documentary I produced yeah, on uh, uh, we, uh, Assange's plight, uh, where he's reflecting on that that video, which made a huge splash and was really WikiLeaks' introduction to the world. I like to roll that clip that and get fun. some of his thoughts, and then get you to you know add any meat onto that. So let's roll that real quick. Light them all up. Come on, fire! Video WikiLeaks would title Collateral Murder showed footage from a U.S. Army Apache helicopter of soldiers gunning down more than a dozen people in Baghdad who weren't engaged in active combat, including two Reuters reporters. The video generated international press and controversy. Assange said his intention was to expose the casual carnage and destruction happening in the course of the U.S. war in Iraq. It was the another day at the office. How routine it was, a whole street covered with bodies. The reaction to that was nuts. And so, as we've, you've made very clear in this interview, the, uh, the, the charges against Assange have nothing to do with all these rumors swirling around what happened in 2016. It's about the release of these documents in 2010, uh, including this video. Um, what was the import of the collateral murder video? Well, it really marks a before and an after um, concerning the Bush wars. Uh, this had, it's 2010, right? This actual um, uh, event uh, depicted in the video is I believe from July 20, uh, 2007. And so the war had started in 2003 
um, and it had been going for seven years by the time Collateral Murder was released. And by then, there wasn't, you know, much interest in the media anymore. There were embedded journalists uh, traveling, you know, with with U.S. convoys and going to press briefings by the Pentagon and so on. Um, but there was no real insight. Um, there were just body bags coming back from Iraq, um, and uh, and there was no like real um, uh, news worthiness, let's say, in reporting about Iraq. And then suddenly this came um, down uh, and it had such an impact because it really contrasted with what, uh, with the curated um, uh, information uh, that was coming yeah. through the media. And it, and it, it was, it depicts a war crime. That's, that's what you see. It's, it's not just the gunning down of these individuals to begin with, where uh, um, two Reuters journalists are on assignment and and get killed, one of them crawls tries to crawl uh, to to cover, and then a van pulls up, and um, two good Samaritans come out of the van and try to um, pick pick up this uh, journalist and then bring him into the van, and then it gets shoots shot down. Um, and everyone dies except for two children who are um, shielded by the body of their father. Uh, so this is a, a truly horrific um, video, and it's horrific not just because you're watching it, but because you're you're listening to the conversation and the kind of um, uh, uh, jokey yeah, conversation like around casual, this and so on. Yeah. And it's it, it's become um, to the Iraq War what that picture of the of the napalm girl you know in Vietnam um, is to the Vietnam War the one where she's walking or she's running um, naked away from the village that has just been napalmed. Um, it is uh, I think Chelsea Manning has said that it is like in 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 thirty minutes you see just the the concentration the um, Iraq war in its essence. And it really captured the international, um, the international imagination. And in 2011, December, 2011, uh, Obama, um, Obama had by then the, the, uh, Obama's, um, sorry, the U S military had, had been, um, removed officially at least, uh, from Iraq. Um, in in big in a big part because of what WikiLeaks had published, including there was another report in one of the cables about a family that was massacred, and um, and the evidence of that event had then been destroyed by a U.S. airstrike, and um, all of the members, including five children under the age of five, had had bullets in their head, and and it was a U.S. air raid in the middle of the night in a village in Iraq. Um, so these WikiLeaks had a major impact in, um, in the way uh, US policy um, developed after that point of the publication of the collateral murder video. Um, and, you know, also with the Afghan war, it took another 10 years or nine years uh, for that to finish. And we all know how that ended. Um, yeah. But it, it didn't just show the carnage in Iraq, but the senselessness of sending um soldiers to fight this this war in iraq and dying and getting injured and of course the epidemic of suicides that that has followed and is ongoing right um so it has a major i mean the, it can't be uh, overstated uh yeah, how and, important yeah these and, publications and it's, have been. it's very it's just very telling to me that this is what the U.S. is prosecuting him over is facilitating the release of undeniably true information about the war that the U.S. was prosecuting so that the people could have a clearer vision of what was going on. And it clearly had an impact on people's view of that war. And for me, Julian Assange is a figure of world historical importance because of what he unlocked with WikiLeaks. I mean, he demonstrated undeniably that the strategic use of technology like encryption 
would be shifting the entire global power structure. And he ushered in that new reality, really. It, it, it was the reality that the cypherpunk movement dreamed of, of this world where a small team of hackers and activists can just share information. And even the most powerful governments can't do anything to stop the release of that information. And he pushed it into being and showed a whole generation that maybe resistance to these powerful super states actually isn't futile. And um, if you have the right tools and you know how to use them, you can really change the world. And I think that might be a big part of why he's a marked man more so than his alleged crimes. Um, but is there anything else to say that you want to say as we're wrapping up about his significance as a cypherpunk or kind of his place in history? Um, well, I think um, Julian is a is a visionary and a pioneer, as you say. Uh, his writings and his speeches, many of his speeches or, or clips have gone viral uh, on the internet, you know, in relation to Ukraine, for example, he was talking about Afghanistan, but um, his kind of big picture analysis and uh, criticism of, of the um, drivers of war, the true drivers of war, um, have uh, currency now. And in fact, you know, I, I uh, often go back to things that he wrote 10 years ago, um, because they are, they have stood the test of time. And, um, you know, he is, he is a, a, a global um, figure and um, a thinker of our times and the type that, that uh, is, is direly needed. Um, so, you know, Julian has to be freed, not just because this is uh, an enormous injustice and the, the precedent it sets um, affects journalists everywhere in the US, um, but also globally, um, it's an extreme overreach. It uh, criminalizes uh, the publication of true information um, of the highest public importance, but also because of Julian's uh, position as a public intellectual and of someone who promotes uh, truth and um, and is a critic of of war um, and uh, just I'm not sure when this is airing but um, there's a a house resolution currently um, which is being pushed which has been uh, tabled, I think that's the word they use in the US, mm -hmm. I don't know, by Paul Gozar, um, mm -hmm. that says, um, expressing the sense of House, the House of Representatives, that regular journalistic activities are protected under the First Amendment, and that the US ought to drop char all charges and attempts to extradite Julian Assange. Yes, and there, there's also a, uh, a letter that's been signed by multiple congressmen, and including Thomas Massey, who we interviewed last week, uh, asking Biden to do the same thing, to drop the extradition. So to, to right. wrap this up, can you tell me, like, are you optimistic that there will be some sort of shift in the political winds, that this some, something can change for Julian's case? Like, how are you feeling at the end of the day here? Well, I think that um, politicians that actually take the time, or at least their um, their staffers that take the time to look at this case, will immediately understand the dangers and the un-American nature. I mean, really, the, the First Amendment is something that is quite unique in the world, and it defines the political culture of the United States, which is much more open and dynamic than other parts of the world, Europe, for sure. Um, and this case is actually kind of a, 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 a more Europeanized, more um, mm. not to talk down Europe too much, but it is uh, no, totalitarian do. in its nature and it changes, it shifts the political culture and it has to be reversed. And I think any, um, you know, the vast majority of uh, politicians that look at this case seriously will be, will understand uh, that the dangers of this case, that it should never come uh, to pass, and that the case should be dropped. And I'd ask uh, any viewers to contact their representatives and ask them to support any efforts to drop the case against Julian. 
uh, that, that's a, a good final call to action um, for anyone who's worried about free speech, the future of press freedom in America. Stella Assange, thank you for talking to Reason. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and Facebook page every Thursday and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Friday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.